Hello everyone, my name is Nicolas Noé and I am an IT expert for the Belgian Biodiversity Platform. In this BID training workshop, I am the facilitator of the Blue Group and I am also in charge of the data publication module. This data publication module will be presented in several videos that are intended to be watched in order. So today, I will present you the first of those videos, which is about data publication concepts. You will need those concepts uh, to be able to perform the actual data publishing. So let's go. A short definition. Data publishing or data publication refers to making our biodiversity data sets publicly accessible, but also discoverable in a standardized form via an access point, which is typically a web address. An important point here is the standardized form. We will use uh, standards to ensure that different systems and different databases have a common language to communicate together. In practice, here is what we will do. We will start with our biodiversity data in a, in a spreadsheet, in a standard spreadsheet, like for example an Excel sheet. And we will perform all the steps to make it available as all the other data sets on the JBIF website. From the Excel template to the JBIF website. Once it's on the website, it can be discovered, it can be downloaded, it can be used by everyone for their research, for, for example. Classes of datasets. In general, the use of the term biodiversity data is broad and encompasses many things. For example, observations in the fields, but maybe also things like genomics or images obtained through remote sensing. Now, when we are in the specific context of JBIF publishing, there are currently only three kind or three classes of datasets that can be published. It's important uh, for you to understand the difference between those three classes because it will allow you to see if and how your, your data uh, is currently uh, GBIF compatible. The first category of data that you can publish at GBIF is occurrences. It's also the most common data type currently at GBIF. It's basically data describing the fact that a given individual was present at a specific time and place. We can take an example. An ichthyologist named Johnson observed an occurrence of the species Beta splendens in a specific lake in Thailand on February 8, 1981. We can really see that it's, we are describing here the occurrence of a given organism at one place in space and, and time. We can have uh, subcategories of occurrences, for example, observations in the fields or specimens that were collected and are kept in a, in a museum of uh, natural history. The second class of data set that we can publish at GBIF is the checklist. A checklist is a catalog or list of named organisms or taxa. Here, the main entity we are describing uh, is a taxonomic uh, concept. A taxonomic concept will probably have fields for things like a scientific name, an author, or a status, but possibly also uh, other things like vernacular names, literature informations, or relationships between different, uh, different taxa. It typically categorizes information along taxonomic, geographic, and thematic lines, or a combination of those. We can take an example. If we have a data set that catalogs the red list mollusks of the Seychelles, it has distinct elements of taxonomy because we are describing uh, mollusks, but also geography, it's on the Seychelles, and a team. It's a species that considered endangered by uh, IUC and experts. The last class of dataset that can be published at JBIF is called sampling event. It's data that's obtained by applying standard protocols for measuring and monitoring biodiversity, such as vegetation transects or marine sampling. The use of protocols allow comparison because they can be repeated in time and in space. 
in such data sets, the main entity is a sampling event with attached information such as uh, the relative abundance of several species, but also environmental data, and for example, the description of the protocol that was used. When publishing a dataset, it's crucial to also provide some information about the dataset itself. This information is called metadata. At GBIF, a typical metadata record will, for example, contain a paragraph with an abstract describing the dataset, some contact information, and maybe also data about the taxonomic and geographic coverage of the datasets. This metadata is very important from the user point of view. If a person wants to use your data, he or she will need to assess the fitness for use. And to do so, he or she will need uh, to have access to the metadata. So, Metadata is really important. We can also say that all datasets published at JBIF requires metadata, but it's also possible to publish metadata alone. We can say it's possible to publish a dataset that actually contains no data, but contains metadata. That may seem strange, but there are many reasons for that. One of it is, for example, uh, the case of an ongoing digitization effort. Maybe your institution is doing such an effort. The data is not ready yet, but you still want to announce to the, to the world that uh, it's happening and describe, uh, describe the effort. Uh, that will give you visibility. And if someone wants to use your data, this person will be already able to contact you and to maybe ask you for, for more information and to show interest before the data is actually published. So that can be used in two steps. You can publish a metadata only dataset and later on add data on it, for example. Licenses are legal documents that describe what can be done with the data you publish. Previously, uh, it was very free and every data publisher could uh, choose or invent his own license or even uh, not choose a license at all when publishing a dataset. And this was causing many problems for several reasons. Uh, for example, because GBIF is an aggregator. And so from the user point of view, what happened when you aggregate and use data from different sources with different uh, use rules that are maybe uh, incompatible. That was a big difficulty. Uh, another one is that we are working in a global, uh, the global scope. So if you invent your own license, you have to make sure that it's valid in uh, like every jurisdiction in the world, which is uh, very hard uh, to do, of course. So at some point, uh, the GBIF community realized that there was a real need for a standardized and international and a well-tested and robust uh, license. A long process took place, uh, but now uh, it's done since 2015. Uh, when you publish a dataset at GBIF, you will have to choose uh, between three uh, licenses and you you have to choose one and it's, uh, yeah, it's mandatory now. Those three licenses are coming from the Creative Commons initiative, which is not specific to JB or to biodiversity. Uh, so it's a good thing because, uh, it's, it's already a well uh, tested license and you will be able to find, uh, many informations if you, if you want, uh, more about that. So the three available Creative Commons licenses uh, at JBIF for publishing datasets are first CC0, which is very open, it's public domain. Everybody can do uh, whatever uh, she or he wants with your data. Uh, the Creative Commons attribution, CC BY, that requires uh, that the user acknowledge you as the source of data. 
on the attribution with non-commercial uh, clause. So it's up to you as a data uh, owner or publisher to choose uh, to choose uh, which one you you want. The non-commercial uh, clause is sometimes uh, deemed uh, controversial because um, some people consider it causes more problems than itself. So you may be interested in a in reading more about this uh, this topic when choosing a license too. Darwin Core, Simple Darwin Core, and Darwin Core Archive are three different standards, data standards that are related but that are different. And I think it's important to understand the difference uh, between those. Those three standards are managed by an organism called TEDIC. The first one, Darwin Core, is just a list of terms. You have a term, like scientific name, and you have a definition attached to this term. Another uh, term is, for example, decimal latitude or life stage. The idea of having standardized name allows to align different databases, because maybe in different databases, the, the scientific name is stored in different columns with different names. If we want to put all that together in an aggregator system like JBIF, we need to, to attach a common, a common name. So that's the idea between uh, Darwin Core. You can find the list of Darwin Core terms at the address that appear on the screen on the Tedwick uh, website. The second one is simple Darwin Core. It's basically using those terms and putting them in a table structure. For example, a spreadsheet where each column uh, represents one Darby Wincore term and one line uh, represents one, uh, one entry in the one data entry. So when we say uh, put your data into Darwin Core, it generally means put it in simple Darwin Core, in a tabular format using uh, Darwin Core terms as, uh, as columns. And then there's a, a last uh, standard, which is Darwin Core Archive. We will talk about it uh, with more detail later. Uh, it's a more advanced and more complex format that allows extensions. Uh, for example, you are publishing uh, occurrences, but you also want to publish some images of this specimen. The extension mechanism of the Rinko Archive will, uh, will allow this, but it will be seen uh, later in an advanced uh, tutorial. Uh, one, last, one last slide for this uh, presentation about data publishing method. Uh, we will talk in the next presentation about the IPT, the Integrated Publishing Toolkit, which is the main tool uh, used to publish biodiversity data at JBIF, but it's not the only one. And this uh, slide shows there are several uh, ways to publish data at JBIF, and also the IPT itself can be used for other things. But in the case of BID and for like 90% of the cases uh, in JBIF, we will assume that the IPT is the publishing uh, tool used to publish data at JBIF. Um, thanks for watching and uh, see you soon for another screencast.